Welcome back to OZK 150, Introduction to Ozark Studies. And as usual, we're going to start our day today with our famous Ozarker. And we'll see who it is today. Somebody will know this one, I'm sure. Who do you think our famous Ozarker is? Nobody knows? I'll bet you've read some of her books, or you had them read to you when you were a kid. Laura Ingalls Wilder, there you go. That's our famous Ozarker of the day, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And of course, we know Laura Ingalls Wilder from the Little House books. And uh, if, you're, if you've ever turned on a TV at some point, uh, you've probably seen a, an episode of Little House on the Prairie based on the on the series of books that she wrote. Uh, Wilder is not a native of the Ozarks. We count her as an Ozarker because she spent most of her adult life living in the Ozarks. She was born in Wisconsin. And if you've, if you've read the books, which are fictionalized accounts of, of her childhood, you know they moved around a whole bunch. They lived in Kansas and, and uh, South Dakota and, and all different kinds of places. But in the 1890s, after she had grown up and, and got married when she was still in her 20s, she and her husband and her young daughter moved to Mansfield, Missouri, which is not too far east of here. Uh, you get there on, on Highway 60 nowadays. And they spent the rest of their lives there. They bought a little farm just east of Mansfield and uh, sort of plodded along and, and made their way until... She was in her mid-60s in the 1930s and started cranking out those Little House books. So there's still time for you. If you, think, if you think it's too early or too late to become a writer, that's a perfect example. Somebody who was retirement age and uh, became famous and quite, uh, quite well off in those latter years of her life. But she is our famous Ozarker for the day and now for our Word of the day, or words in this case, spunk water. Spunk water. Who knows what spunk water means? Is it like stump water? Stump water? You know, it's, it's very much like stump water, uh, and it can be stump water. What do you think stump water what would be the significance of stump water, do you think? Moonshine. Oh, you're, you're thinking like a different name for, for moonshine? Yeah, that's how I would heard it. Yeah. No, the, the, this is different. Uh, you got the stump part right, but the moonshine is a little different. This spunk water is, uh, is in fact, water that you would find in a stump or in a hollowed out part of a tree. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's not moonshine. It was considered by many Ozarkers in the, uh, in the 19th century and into the 20th century to be medicinal, uh, that you could cure various ailments by either drinking spunk water or sitting in spunk water as uh, Enos did. And uh, apparently it was not the best results that he had hoped to, to get. But that's what spunk water is. And occasionally, in an old uh, book on the Ozarks, you'll come across the term spunk water, or certainly in one of Vance Randolph's many books, he, he talks about spunk water. So Enos didn't get the cure he was looking for. Does anybody know what the piles are? Hemorrhoids is an old, old term for hemorrhoids. So Enos probably just made himself worse by sitting in spunk water all day. It just didn't work. Now let's talk a little bit about folk architecture or vernacular architecture in the Ozarks. If you think about folk architecture, what do you think about? What, what kind of building do you think about with the early days in the Pioneer Ozarks? The log cabin, right. Log cabins were, and not just the Ozarks, as with so many things we talk about in this class, the Ozarks wasn't unique. The, the log cabin made its way across the North American frontier. 
to the Ozarks. And, uh, but the log cabin certainly is probably the, the thing that we think of most. And if you look at a list of the priorities for, for newcomers to the Ozarks, for settlers in the 19th century Ozarks, the building of a log cabin was at the top of that list. This is a list of settler priorities that we get from Theodore Peace Russell. Russell was a member of a family that migrated to the eastern Ozarks in what today is Iron County, Missouri, in the late 1830s. And like Laura Ingalls Wilder in, in later years, he started writing down his memories of life in the Ozarks when he was a, a teenager and a young man. And... Uh, Unlike Laura Ingalls Wilder, he didn't become famous for them, though most of them were, were later published. But one of the things that he did was recounted the priorities for settlers in those days. What do you do first? What do you do second? In sort of the order of making yourself at home in the rural Ozarks. And the very first thing that most people did was build a cabin. What do you think is the difference between a a log cabin and a log house. You might know. A log cabin and a log house. The log house has a chimney. Well, uh, you're you're kind of getting there. A log house a log house would have a chimney, and most cabins probably would too, but they wouldn't necessarily because the main difference is a, a log house. Uh, is going to be different in the quality of construction. It's going to be better constructed. The logs are going to be hewed, which means the, the sides are flattened off and, uh, and kind of slicked off. And it's, it's going to be chinked and daubed, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Whereas a log cabin is really the first thing you th that you throw up, just sort of like having, uh, it's, you know, it's sort of the the pioneer's version of the tent. You know, it's the first thing you, you live in because a good hand with an ax could, could build a log cabin in no time, just a, just a couple of days in the Ozarks or in anywhere else. And so a log cabin was just a really roughly put together log building that a settler didn't plan to live in for very long. Probably... Uh, at the most, just a year, maybe make it through the winter or something like that. And a log cabin would almost never have the bark hewed off the sides of the logs. In fact, if uh, you read another account of a person who uh, grew up in the days before the Civil War in the Ozarks, uh, a man by the name of Wiley Britton, who grew up just outside of Neosho, he talks about, in those early days, uh, what he called the... Uh, the round log houses. And if he referred to something as a round log house, it was shorthand for a house that was poorly constructed or just quickly put together and meant to be a temporary house and not something that people were going to live in for a long time. And it even could refer uh, negatively to the, to the kind of social standing of a family that lived in it. If you lived in a round log house for too many years, it probably meant you really weren't all that ambitious and you were just sort of hanging around out there and maybe you, you weren't in account. So that was, uh, that's the difference. A log cabin, a log house, and the goal for most of these people eventually was to have a substantial log house. And we'll talk about those different sorts of log houses in the minute, the, the different varieties of them. But that was the first thing he did. Then you, uh, you would clean a piece of land that you could plant at least a crop of corn on. That was usually the first thing that, that settlers put in, a small crop of corn. And, and you didn't, didn't necessarily have to clean a big chunk of land for this. And, and often you just cleared out sort of the underbrush in, in a wooded area to do this in, especially if where you settled was mainly wooded. You know, it wasn't, wasn't uncommon at all to, to plant a little cornfield basically in the woods. You would uh, cut your, uh, you would make your fence, cut your rails for fence. If you've ever been down to Wilson's Creek, you've seen those rail fences around the park, 
been to any Civil War battlefield. They've always got the same rail fences there. Uh, that, that's, that's what that was, a, a rail fence. There were different kinds of rail fences, but that was your, your standard sort of rail fence. You just you cut rails that are about 10 feet, uh, maybe a little longer in length, and you just kind of lay them across each other. And that was the, the fence that was used in those days. And you fenced in your crops. You didn't fence in animals. Animals ran out wild in the, in the open range days. So you had to fence in your crops. And, and I've read that, in general, it would take about 800 fence rails to fence in an acre of land. So you're talking about a lot of, a lot of rail splitting. You've heard of Abraham Lincoln and his, and his rail splitting. Well, Lincoln didn't spend much time in the Ozarks, but, but uh, lots of people in the Ozarks split rails just like Abe Lincoln did. And it was a, it was a very laborious process, but you could, if you were handy with an axe, you could split a, a lot of rails in, in one day. As a matter of fact, uh, I've got a, an account. This is uh, from a young, young man named James Brown Campbell who settled in central Missouri and, uh, in, and kept a, a diary of the activities that he did after he got to Missouri. And uh, this is his diary from 1820, and he actually talks about making rails uh, in, on April 6th, 7th, and 8th of 1820, he mentions that he, along with his two brothers, made a thousand rails in three days. That's a lot of, that's over a hundred rails apiece uh, per day uh, for, those, for those three young men. And if you're thinking about needing about 800 rails to fence in an acre of land, then they, had, they probably had a lot more rails to, to cut besides that. So that was, uh, that was one of the first things you did as well. Uh, you would uh, then break the land, put your corn crop in. That was uh, pretty standard stuff. Uh, you would then girdle the standing trees. Anybody know what girdling a tree means? Cutting around it. Right, cutting, uh, taking an ax or a saw and, and cutting a circle around the tree in order to kill it. That's what, that's what you do. Usually, uh, you know, this high off the ground, three feet or so off the ground, and you just cut it deep enough that it's eventually going to kill the tree. If you're doing this in the spring of the year, then if it kills the tree, the leaves aren't going to come out. If you're planting your corn in sort of in a wooded area, the sun's going to be able to get in and hit the ground and help the crop grow. And then when the next year comes around, that tree is going to be thoroughly dead and ready to be felled. And then you're letter, uh, ready for your log rolling. And a log rolling isn't maybe what a log rolling sounds like today. If you've ever, when I think of uh, the term log rolling, I think of those you know, one o'clock in the morning on ESPN, those two guys on each end of a, you know, the lumberjack contest, and they're trying to stay on the log while the other one falls off. Well, that, I guess that's one kind of log rolling. I don't know if that's what they call it or not. But this is a different log rolling. This is more of a log stacking and burning. And in a log rolling, what you do is you get your neighbors to all come. You cut down the trees that were girdled last year, and you cut them up into into logs, and then the men would use what were called hand spikes, and these were just uh, kind of uh, uh, tree, young trees, poles that were, you know, that st sturdy but not not too big where you couldn't handle them. And you, you, one person would get on each end of these poles, and you would have each person would have uh, two poles, and you'd have a partner on the other end. And you would slide them under the logs, lift them up, carry them to the pile, the brush pile that you're building. And then uh, the, uh, the person on one end would lay down his poles and, and the other one would roll them off, would kind of tilt and, and roll. Or if it's a really big log, then you might have uh, one person on e either end of the pole and maybe four guys working on one really big log. If, you know, they got, uh, if they got that big. But that's what a log rolling was. And then you, you pile them up 
you roll them into piles, and then you burn them. If you're not going to use them for, for some purpose, that's what you did with them. And it gets rid of them. You might use the ashes for something to help uh, fertilize the ground or, or something like that. But that was a log rolling. And that was always done the, the second year of settlement, uh, usually before uh, planting or, or anything like that. But that was sort of the order that uh, Theodore Peace Russell talked about. And, of course, the first order was the, the building of the cabin. And we know that this cabin then was the most basic element of the, of the farmstead, of the homestead of an Ozark pioneer in the 19th century. The cabins then would turn into log houses at some point, or they'd be replaced by log houses. We, uh, we still debate, I don't necessarily debate, I, I haven't done any primary research into this, but there are still lots of scholars out there that debate about the origins of the, the log house or the log cabin. Where did they come from? Who introduced them to America? They become so associated with American pioneer life. Where do they come from? Because the American Indians didn't live in them. And the British settlers who came over uh, didn't bring that log building tradition with them. And most scholars chalk up the log building tradition either to Germans or to Scandinavians. And if you can uh, imagine a, a heated debate between academics over log houses, this is one of those. There, they, there are still people who get bent out of shape if you disagree with them over where they come from. Uh, but uh, we pretty much narrowed it down to either the Germans or the Scandinavians. One interesting theory that came out about uh, 20 or 25 years ago was that the origin of the log cabin was in the Delaware River Valley, in the area kind of uh, below Philadelphia there, and that it was introduced to that area by Scandinavians, specifically settlers in New Sweden, and not just the Swedes, but the Finns. Uh, the, the New Sweden colony also included a number of Finnish people, and one theory is that it was actually uh, people of Finnish descent who brought the log cabin to America, or that, the kind of log cabin building tradition to America, and then bequeathed that to the American, the more standard American settlers, because we generally don't think of the Finns when we think of pioneer America. There weren't that many of them who came over. Uh, but then certainly the English and the Germans and, and other people who settled in colonial America added their own elements to the log cabin. So we think probably it's, it's quite possible that the basic model of the log cabin or the log building was Finnish or perhaps German. And then that Germans added things like the, the wood shingled roof. The British probably came along and added the doorways on the eaves side of buildings instead of on the gable end. If you think a, a, a church house uh, usually has the doorway on the gable end, you know, the end under the V. Uh, but in most of these log houses that we'll see, uh, the, uh, the, the tradition was to put the doorway under the eaves side, on the side, of the, the long side of the house. And, and the British probably added the, the exterior chimney as a tradition on the, on the gable end. So, so by the time the log house or the log cabin gets the, to the Ozarks, it's become an amalgam of lots of different European traditions and probably some that are more purely American, things that just, you know, that, that people here on, in North America came up with and thought, well, this works better and, and we'll do this. But that's a little bit about the origins of the, of the log cabin. And then uh, there are lots of different uh, types of cabins uh, that, that we will talk about. Uh, and all of them, though, had in, in common a certain things, like uh, the, the chimney that was almost always on the, the gable end of these cabins. Most of them, most of the, the old log cabins, as opposed to log houses, would have 
either dirt floors or what were called punching floors. It was very common if you were just building a log cabin, a round log house, as Wiley Britton would call it, then why even bother putting a floor in it? If you're going to be in there for a year, you know, just leave the dirt floor uh, for that matter. If you're trying to improve it a little bit, you might build a punching floor in it. And a punching floor was basically where you would take logs and split them in half. And the floor would then be made, out, made by uh, lying the logs round end, uh, round side to the ground. So you had the, the flat side up and, and you'd make kind of a floor that way. As you can imagine, those couldn't have been uh, splinter free. I'm thinking, you know, barefoot walking in the old punch and floor house may have been an adventure in those days. But uh, punch and floors would continue even into the, when people built more sturdier, more lasting log houses. It was, it was still pretty common to have punch and floors in those before people started adopting solid lumber floors, you know, finished, finished floors like that. So the punch and floor uh, was very common in, in a lot of these old houses. And uh, the size varied greatly, the size of a log house. A lot of it depended on how large the logs were that you could get, how, how big the trees were in the area. Most of the log houses were probably uh, less than 20 feet square. And that's not, you know, that's not a terribly large large house, uh, but if you, if you lived in a place with really substantial trees, you might build a, a log house that's bigger than that. Uh, they also uh, chinked and daubed this house. I mentioned chinking and daubing earlier. Uh, chinking was uh, the materials that you would put in between the logs. When you, when you build a log house, there's, a, there's, the, there's the, these interstices, these uh, spaces between the logs and if it's just a barn or just a place to you know to keep out varmints or something like that big varmints like bears or something you might not even worry about having these spaces between the logs but if you want a house that's going to be warm in the in the winter time you want to fill these in and so you would you would fill them in with what was called chinking and that could be uh, little sticks or boards or rocks or moss, just any, any number of things that you could get and fill in space in the, in the local area. And then you would daub this, which is basically you would, you would make some kind of homemade mortar and put it in there that would dry and keep the chinking from coming out. And so you would, you would fill in the spaces that way. And daubing could, could be mud, could be clay. Uh, if you were really sort of uptown, you might smash up some limestone and make a kind of limestone daubing and a mortar that way and that would, that would hold really well. And you might even use the limestone to whitewash the building. If you, you know, that, that was a sign of prosperity if you had a, a whitewashed building of some sort in those days, even if you had to make the whitewash yourself. But so all these houses were... Uh, chinked and daubed in some way. And certainly if you lived in a house that wasn't uh, chinked and daubed, you were giving your neighbors another excuse to look down on you. And you didn't want the Britons looking down on you if you were living around Neosho in, in the 1850s. So, uh, so there, was a, there was a right way and a, and a wrong way even you know, to go about building these log houses like that. This is so, what... Uh, Probably what Roundtree's and his buddies' uh, log houses would have looked like that they built here in the Springfield area, uh, three of them in, in a week. So you know they're not very fancy. You're going to throw three of those things up, basically one every two days. Uh, but this was the most basic kind. We call this a single pin log house for obvious reasons. It's just one room. It's basically a log room with a roof on it and a door. Maybe that you can see this one has two doors, maybe three or four doors. I'm not sure how many. We can't see the other sides, so we don't know. But pretty basic thing. 
You can see the, uh, the logs are, uh, the log houses are built with logs laid horizontally, not like the French style that we talked about earlier with the vertical log construction where you actually stick the logs or poles down into the ground. These are horizontal logs. And you just notch them on the corners. We'll look at, at the way that the, the corners of, the, of these buildings are notched or fit together. They're not nailed together. This required a lot of skill uh, to build it. You could build one in a, in a pretty good hurry, but you had to be pretty good with an axe too to build one of these log houses because you had to notch them and fit them together at the edges so it wouldn't just fall apart. Most of, the, of these uh, single pin log houses were 20 feet square or less. A lot of them were 15, 16 feet square. That's not very big. That's one little room. And these houses were not usually meant to be long-term residences. When you built a, a single pin cabin like that, you were probably thinking, we'll live in this a couple years, Things, times get better, we'll build a bigger one or we'll build another pin like this and hook it to the old pin and we'll see what we come up with when we do that here in a minute. But pretty simple, pretty basic, uh, not very big. You can see uh, usually they, they'll have a chimney on one end in the early days, the chimneys were, uh, they were not made of brick. Uh, they were often not made of stone. They were sometimes made of mud and sticks and uh, sometimes just stacked rocks with no mortar or anything. Did they put the bottom log on, on rocks? Right. You can see here, this one has uh, what's left of an, of an old foundation. Uh, they're just... In this case, it's just rocks that they've got under there. And most of the, most of the time, uh, the log house would be set on at least some kind of foundation, even if it was a rock on each of the four corners, something like that. I was just uh, over the weekend reading an account of a guy who was in uh, southeast Missouri around 1820, and he talked about visiting a log cabin uh, that had a dirt floor. He said it was, it was basically about a 16 feet square log cabin and they had no floor in it. It was just, just dirt. And that was the most basic thing. And in that case, they just had the logs sitting on the ground. Uh, but usually, especially in later years, uh, they would at least have some sort of foundation for them to sit on. But again, most people didn't spend just a whole lot of years in a cabin like that. Uh, unless they were just really poor or just really back in the woods somewhere, the idea was to eventually build another pen to add on to it or build another house completely, ultimately maybe build a frame house, which was considered much nicer than a log house. And I think I brought, yeah, I brought a couple of things. Uh, now, of course, we're talking about the early 1800s here, but this kind of construction continued into the 20th century. And I came across this story from uh, north central Arkansas. This is a woman who was writing in the 1970s uh, and remembering her childhood in the early 1900s. And she mentioned that her family, uh, they lived south of Mammoth Spring, Arkansas, which is just right under the state line down there, right below Thayer, Missouri. They, their house burnt in 1913, and her dad and her brothers rebuilt a, a log house, basically one just pretty much like that, a 16 by 16 foot log house just to give them a place to, to live in. And eventually they kept the log house and built and kept building on to it. And whenever they had the opportunity and the money, they would build another room onto this log house until eventually they had like a four-room house. But it all started with this one little log house that they built in 1913. And that's really late for log house building, 
uh, but it was, it was a, a craft, uh, a style of architecture that was still in the Ozarks, you know, just a hundred years ago. <coughs> so, so that was a, a pretty, pretty neat thing. They also, uh, they did, uh, when they built their house in 1913, they did buy uh, milled lumber for the floor and the ceiling and stuff like that. So it wasn't quite as... Uh, as pioneer and archaic as some of the early uh, log houses were, because they did have access to sawmills and stuff like that, but it was much cheaper for them to, when they needed a house immediately to build a, to build a log house. This is the uh, double pin house, and pretty easy concept, two single pins side by side with a with a doorway or a, an open hallway in, in, inside the house to go from one to another. Sometimes these double pin houses result from just building a second pin onto an original single pin log cabin. Or sometimes a house is built from the beginning as a double pin house. And a double... You're saying what's that's it? not one big house. Well, it's, it's, it's one house, but it's, it's basically constructed as two of those single pins that we just looked at. They're just side by side. Yeah. And, and there, would be, there would be a wall in here, yeah, with probably a doorway connecting the two rooms. Yeah. Because, as I said, a lot of times the double pin houses are just a result of, okay, we built our single pin house three years later, we got three more kids, and here, here we are. We need a, a second pin, so you just build on to the first one. And you've got uh, two fireplaces, two chimneys on this one, one at either end. Now, this style of house continued to be popular in the rural Ozarks well into the 20th century. Not necessarily as a log house, but even when people started to build frame houses, they often kept these old vernacular styles. And you see lots and lots of old houses. They're usually abandoned nowadays, but I, I know some people who still live in these old houses that are double pin houses, but they're frame houses. They were just built on that old double pin log cabin uh, blueprint. And... They, so if you've seen these old houses with two front doors and you wonder why in the world would somebody build a house with two front doors, they used to be very common and it wasn't uh, as if the two front doors had a special function in Ozark society. That's just, they were just copying earlier styles of, of architecture. Now they could, they could have a function if you had... Uh, you know, if you had that interior doorway and you kept it shut and you kept the two rooms separate, you know, you could go in and out either room that way. Uh, so it could, you know, it could be handy that way. But for the most part, it's just two front doors. I know a guy uh, down in Arkansas who still lives in one of these. He's in his 80s now. Uh, and it's, I've visited him many times and he's, I've never seen him use the right door. He always uses the left door. Because I think the, the right side of the house is where his bedroom is, and the left side is, is sort of the living room, is where the, the wood stove is. So, you know, the other, the other door may just be permanently welded shut or something. I'm not sure. I've never seen it open. But his house looks very much like that. So that's the double pin house. A modified version of the double pin house that you used to see every once in a while. This was much more uh, or much less common. Was the so-called saddlebag house, and the only difference between this and the double pin is the placement of the chimney. In this case, uh, the saddlebag house has one chimney in the middle, fireplace for both rooms, but it's it's in the middle. And so you get that kind of saddlebag quality to it, and that's where the, the name comes from, the saddlebag house. 
And I think this is an old picture, if I remember right. I've had this one so many years, I don't remember exactly. I think that's, this is an old picture from a house in Taney County, which is down in the Branson area. And you can see this one has a pretty good foundation under it. And I don't know if that's a log house or a frame house. Again, it could be either one. It looks like it has two storage as well. Yeah, that's, and then that one's got, this would be uh, what, what's often referred to as a story and a half. And a lot of those, a lot of the old uh, log houses had, uh, had the first floor and then they had kind of a modified attic sort of thing. Uh, if you remember uh, watching Little House on the Prairie, you know, that uh, again wasn't an Ozark house, but they had that where the kids slept in the loft, basically, and you had kind of a half of a second floor there, and that's probably similar to that. And, and that one may just be a full second floor, too. But now, a lot of these times, you can see these buildings or these houses in the Ozarks, and they look like they're frame houses. Uh, but it's because they've just put siding on log houses. So it's hard to tell with some of them until you get underneath and kind of poke around or get under, uh, underneath the house and you know, look at the original timbers and all that sort of stuff to tell exactly what they are. Again, two, two doors on that one, close together. I guess if you wanted to turn your house into apartments, that'd be handy, you know, have the, have the doors or, or uh, you know, a bed and breakfast or something. Now, maybe the most famous and picturesque of the, of the log houses is the so-called dog, dog trot house. You can probably figure out why it's referred to as a dog trot house. The passageway or the breezeway in there, uh, you know, a dog can may not trot through it, but dogs like to lay in those little breezeways if, you, if you've got one of them. And, and so this one is basically just your two pins connected by a roof and maybe a, a half floor, some sort of uh, attic. Uh, in this particular house, there is uh, a, a half floor on top uh, that you could use as a sleeping room or, or something like that or an attic. Uh, this one was built shortly after the Civil War. And this one was actually built from the beginning as a dog trot. Now, the dog trots, like the double pin, often took shape over the course of years where you would have one side built, and then a couple years later, they would build the other side and just connect them like that. And that's how the dog trots often <laughs> took shape. The, the breezeway uh, could be used for... Uh, for a shady place to sit in the summertime. Uh, I've read about people who slept in those breezeways and the dog trots in the, when it was really hot in the summer. You know, get a little breeze going through there and it's a lot nicer than being inside. It looks like the doors were in the original. Uh, this, uh, this particular house does have doors inside the breezeway. Now, they, they didn't necessarily all have to, but, uh, but it would have been convenient to be able to go from the breezeway into the house, into one of the pens. So this house does have doors on each side of the breezeway where you can go into the house. And the actual, the fr this is actually the back of the house that we're looking at here. The, the front doors are, are on the other side, uh, so there are, in, there are middle doors on the, fr on the other side of the house. And you can see this one is built on a little bit of a slope, so it's got the foundation. We're on the, the low side right there. And this one does have the wooden shingles on top of it. And I had a couple of uh, first-hand accounts. Yeah, here's a guy who lived in the southeastern Ozarks, and he's uh, describing his grandparents' dog trod house uh, that they were still living in when he was a boy in the early 1900s. They built it shortly after the Civil War. And 
he mentioned that the, the rooms were about 15 feet square, so it's pretty small, pretty small rooms on this particular house. Uh, the the lo logs were made out of white oak. Uh, they could be made of pine, white oak, red oak, you know, whatever he, you had available. He also mentions that the out, in, in his uh, grandparents' house, the outside of the logs were whitewashed with a lime solution to preserve the wood. So that would have been a smart thing to do if you're wanting to, to make the thing last. Uh, in this particular house, the ceiling and the floor were made of cypress boards. Now, cypress would have been an unusual building uh, tool in the, in the Ozarks, but where they lived, he lived in the southeastern part of the Ozarks, very near the delta, and they were close enough to actually cut cypress and, and, and bring it into the hills. And he also mentions... Uh, that they had pegs on the outside uh, stuck into the logs for hanging uh, saddles and, and such as that. I mentioned that his grandpa's bed had a homemade gun rack hanging over it made out of a big forked limb. And uh, a lot of their, uh, their furniture was homemade as well out of uh, walnut and, and other kinds of wood. And he, uh, he does mention, as we, as we said earlier, that these... Dog trots kind of take shape over time. He mentions that the, the other half of the dog trot was built in later years and wasn't as high of quality as, the, as what they considered the main part of the house. It was newer, but it wasn't built as good. And that's one of the things you find too is a lot of times some of the best quality log buildings are the older ones. When, uh, when people were still actively building log buildings, they had... They were better at the techniques. You were more likely to find somebody in the community who was real good with an ax and could notch the logs just right and could straighten them up and, and, and everything like they needed to be. The closer you get to the 20th century and into the 20th century, the more people lose those skills and traditions. And a lot of times the, the log houses that are built in the early 20th century are just kind of thrown together and they don't look as good, and they don't last as long either. Let's see. We got. Uh... Oh, and this is a, this is an interesting. It's from Taney County. This is a, a log house that was built in the 1880s. And in this particular community in Taney County. The, the family that built the log house got a neighbor who was, who was considered the best axe man in the community to hew out the logs for the house. Uh, they used white oak logs. Uh, they built a, a dog trot house. Both pens were 20 by 24 feet. So that's pretty big. Pretty, a 24 foot log is a big log. Of course, you would have had white oak logs in those days before the the timber boom came through the region and cut all the virgin timber out. You would have had some white oak logs that were that big. Each one of the pens had a half loft or a half story upstairs. They had a stone fireplace on, on each end. Uh, they, this, this house would have been a, a really nice house in the 1880s in, in Taney County or just about anywhere else in the Ozarks. They had a full-size cellar uh, that was lined with stone and it had an eight-foot ceiling. That's a huge cellar with an eight-foot eight ceiling. Uh, they had a, a local stonemason who helped build the fireplace and the cellar. He also made a, a rock-lined drain for the cellar. And, and she talks about uh, making the, the limestone uh, mortar, the lime-based mortar with sand and water and all that kind of stuff. So pretty... Uh, a pretty impressive house with pine flooring, real windows. You know, they were uptown. This family was unusual. They were, uh, they were of German descent. That wasn't terribly unusual, but they were unusual in that when they first came to the Ozarks, before they built this dog trot in the 1880s, their first house they built was a, was a stone house. And in the 1800s, that was very unusual for uh, pioneers to build their houses out of stone. It became very common in the 20th century. Uh, the house that I live in is made out of stone. It was built in the, in the 1950s. It, very common 
in those days made out of field stone and stuff, but, but for a family to build a stone house in the 1870s was, was very unusual, especially uh, made out of cut stone. Uh, that, was a, that was an unusual thing. It probably had something to do with the fact that they were of German descent, and that was a tradition. All right, so we're moving on up here. We're getting fancy. This house would have been uh, the symbol of prosperity for people in the rural Ozarks by the late 1800s. And even in a few cases, you would have seen some of these so-called eye houses at the time of the Civil War, but they would have been very rare in the Ozarks at that point. As the 19th century wore on and certainly into the early 20th century, more and more farm families were able to build these eye houses and you can see two-story houses that are uh, usually one room deep. A lot of these houses, uh, this one has uh, five windows across it, so it, it may be a little fancier. But a lot of them were just four-room houses, but they were, big, they were four big rooms and uh, two on top, two on bottom. You can see... Uh, this one's got a nice big porch. The eye houses uh, usually had a big porch, which was something that the old log houses generally didn't have. You know, today we think of country houses and having big porches and you sit around, stuff like that. Well, that's more of a, uh, that, you know, that's not something the pioneers did. They weren't too worried about their porches. You know, your dog trot had about as good a porch as, as anything. Does anybody know where the, the eye comes from in the eye house? It's, it's sort of, I mean, you could, you could almost say it did. Uh, according to scholars, the, the term actually it comes from uh, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa. It was... It was it was termed the eye house because these houses were so common on the, the flat uh, farmlands of Illinois and Indiana and Iowa. The kind of mid, these were sort of your typical Midwestern farmhouses of the late 1800s and early 1900s, and so they just called them eye houses. But you, you, know, you, could, you could see where you could also say, you know, if you're looking at kind of the side view, it's got sort of an eye look to it. Yeah, these, uh, the eye houses, uh, you could build a, a log eye house, but most of them were frame. Yeah, and that was part of what made them kind of uptown as well. If you were uh, prosperous enough to build a frame house, even a little frame house in the rural Ozarks, then you were better off than, than most of your neighbors back in the 1800s. If you could afford to buy uh, milled lumber and, you know, put up that frame house and not rely on uh, cutting logs, you know, that was a sign of, of some prosperity, yeah. So these were nice. And you can still see, uh, drive out in the country, and you'll still see a lot of these old eye houses uh, that are still occupied today. They're really nice houses. They're not, they're not the fancy status symbols that they once were, uh, but, but they're still <coughs> nice houses. And one of the things they tell you as you're traveling around the rural Ozarks, if you see a lot of these eye houses in an area, you know that was once probably prosperous farming area, wherever that was. You would have seen a lot of them in the Springfield Plain area where we are. Not as many of them in Douglas County or Ozark County. You get down in, uh, the, you know, down in the real Ozarks and they would have been much scarcer. And our last house example here, the so-called Central Hall Cottage. And this is basically a 20th century house in the Ozarks. Uh, you would have found the, the so-called Central Hall Cottage back east in the, in the 19th century, but very rarely in the Ozarks. Uh, it's, uh, and it's often more of a townhouse as well. 
And in some ways, the central hall cottage is kind of like a, it would be similar to taking a dog trot and putting siding on it and filling in the, and covering up the, the interior hallway, breezeway, because the central hall cottage, where it gets its name is it's got a central hall that goes through the house from the front to the back, and there's usually a back door kind of even with the front door, and you got two rooms or maybe four rooms, depending on how, how wide, how thick the house is. Uh, but again, you wouldn't have had a whole lot of these in the Ozarks until the, until the 20th century. And most of these wouldn't have been log houses either. So we've got single pins, double pins, saddlebags, dog trots, and we get into the fancy eye house construction. We mentioned that it took skill to notch the logs, the, the edges of the house, uh, because you're not uh, talking about a house that's put together with nails. This is all uh, log notching. And these are just uh, six different kinds of notching that you can see on old log houses. The most common type of notching that I've seen on old, old log houses and, and log barns in the Ozarks is the so-called half dovetail notch. You can see what it looks like there, but you've got diamond notches and full dovetails and squares. I guess, you know, square notches or saddle notches probably would have been the easiest to do. And, and I've noticed uh, when I found Barns, say, that were built, log barns that were built in the 20th century, they're often, uh, they often just use saddle notching. You know, it's not even real neat either. You just kind of cut a groove out of one log and, and, and a, cut a groove out of the bottom of the other one and place them on it. That's kind of the Lincoln log style. Does anybody have Lincoln logs when you were a kid? I think we still have Lincoln logs out there we can use. Uh, and the, the Lincoln logs... I guess they're square notched, aren't they, or, or are they round? They're, uh, are they saddle? Yeah, I don't know. It, they're been, square. They're square? Okay. I'm going to take your word for it. You're the guy who, who uh, knew about the, the miniature builders up in uh, uh, Lynn Creek. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's been too many years since I've had a, had a Lincoln log. But... Uh, but again, that was all done with, with an axe, and it was done as the houses uh, were uh, being constructed. And one of the things that, uh, that was true of the Ozarks as it was true of the frontier anywhere is there were, as I mentioned earlier, there was usually someone in a community who was known uh, as being extra good with an axe, extra good at hewing logs for house construction, just as there would be someone uh, who, uh, who was good at tanning hides or building white oak baskets. or just uh, People had different skills, just as we do today, and not everybody did everything. Uh, people tended to have a lot more skills than we have today when it came to these, these sort of everyday requirements of the frontier. They had to, to survive. But even if you knew how to do that, you would want the best person. If you were building a house you were going to live in for a few years, you would want the best axe man to be working on the notches to hold that thing together for as long as it would hold together. And some of the people who built the houses that survived today uh, were very skilled, very, very skilled at what they did. The, uh, was it last week, I believe, we looked at the Wolf House, uh, the Jacob Wolf House, down uh, where the North Fork River comes into the White River. We saw that two-story log house, very impressive structure, uh, just excellent craftsmanship on that. And that house is uh, probably now over 180 years old and still holding together pretty well. So somebody, somebody knew what they were doing with that one. All right, any questions about our log construction, our... House building. Okay, we will take a break and come back and talk about barn building next.